Oh, thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. Welcome to Build. I am your host, Ricky Camilleri, and our next guest is, uh, without a doubt, one of the funniest people to ever grace the television screen. For 10 years, she's been the foul mouth nemesis of Larry David on the great Curb Your Enthusiasm, and now she's returning for its 10th season, where Susie Esman plays Susie, and she's here to chat with us yes. about it now. Let's hear it. <laughs> Hi. That's probably, of all the, the ridiculous outfits I've worn, that might be my favorite. Yeah, that is a pretty <laughs> ridiculous outfit. I mean, Susie has always had a- You look a, like P.T. Barnum. That's exactly what you look like. You look like a carnival barker. Exactly. <laughs> She's always had a sort of weird sense of, of fashion, but yes. when this came up for the first episode, I imagine this was your first day of shooting for the season? Uh, you know, I don't remember, because we, we shoot a lot out of sequence. We used to shoot in su sequence, but it's gotten too complicated. So I'm not sure if that was my first day. I'm not sure. What did you think when you showed up on set and you saw that hat? Well, I knew all about the hat, because Larry had <laughs> seen somebody wearing that hat, and uh, he texts me, you know, I'm making you wear this hat next season. I was like, fine with me, you know, so I knew all about it. And then I, I always have fittings, so I know... Right. what I'm wearing ahead of time. Because I, I kind of uh, work with our wardrobe, design, uh, wardrobe designer, Leslie Schilling, work with her to create the outfits. Did you, you were you friends with Larry prior to Curb Your yes. Enthusiasm? Yes. You guys had a relationship and that yeah. was how you started getting, that's how you got on well, the show. You know, we, were, we were all, Jeff also, uh, Lewis not so much because he had moved to LA by the time I came on the scene. Um, but I, I met Larry 1985, 86 at Catch a Rising Star. And, you know, we were, it was a very small community in those days of stand-up, so we all knew each other. Right. Um, so now that you are Susie on Curb, yeah. who is a different person than I'd imagine Susie Espen is reality. I would hope so, Ricky. What has it been like to watch this character evolve and change and become more of a character and further away from you as the person who got cast using well, your name? Well, she was far away from me from, right from, the, from beginning. the beginning. You know, I, I don't want to play myself. I'm with myself 24-7. What do I want to play myself for? So I always want to play a character that's bigger or, or, or just kind of more fun to be for me to play. Uh, I don't dress like her, as you could see. <laughs> um, I'm not as... as I mean, don't push me. I could get there, but I'm not as... I, I, I don't curse like her. I'm not Do as Do people angry. try to push you these days just to hear you curse Only a little bit? Only my husband. Only your um, husband. I, 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 she's, Susie Green is very... She's simple in a certain way. She's completely secure in her feelings and her opinions about everything. Yeah. I'm a comedian. I analyze everything. I second-guess everything. I question everything. No, she, she's right. She has this reaction. She's right. She responds. That's it. <laughs> and I just found that incredibly liberating to play. Were there, when you signed up to be Susie Green, were there conversations with, with you about who, who Susie Green was going to be? None. None. Larry and I have never spoken about the character, ever. Really? Ever. We've never spoken about our relationship. But that seems so strange considering so much it, of it is improvised. We're strange people. There was no, it, there was no need to sort of, I mean, so what, how was she pitched to you? Okay, here's how it happened. Season one, I was in three episodes. Two of the episodes were just kind of innocuous. I'm just introducing Jeff's wife, you know, because Jeff plays Larry's manager. And then there was an episode called The Wire, where Jeff brings a fresh air front kid into the house who robs us blind. And that was the episode that Larry hired me for. Larry had seen me. I mean, I knew Larry from doing stand-up, then, but then he moved to L.A. And I, to do Seinfeld, and I didn't see him for years. Was Catch a Rising Star in New York? Yeah. Oh, I yeah. didn't know that. Oh, yeah, it was on it was First LA. Avenue and 77th Street. Yeah. No, I've never lived in L.A. I'm a diehard New Yorker. Still? Uh, still, yeah. So, um, so in that episode... He wanted, the only direction, can I use language on this oh, show? Oh, please do. Okay. The only, <laughs> There's no way Susie Esmond's not cursing okay. on my the stage only, today. I, I don't, you know, I just came from doing the Today Show. What the hell do I know? <laughs> so um, uh, the only direction Larry gave me is I want you to rip Jeff a new asshole. <laughs> was the direction he gave me. And I was like, all right, well, I've been in relationships. I know how to do that. So, um, <laughs> and, and that was the only thing he gave me for that character. So I just created it. I just did it, screaming and yelling and screaming. And then he kept on saying to me, go further, go further, go further. So I was going further. And then he pulls me aside and he says, make fun of Jeff's fat. And I said, you know what, Larry? I don't really want to do that because I don't like making fun of people's physical characteristics. You know, it's mean. He's like, just do it, just do it. He knows you're only uh, acting. It's no big deal. You're not going to hurt his feelings. So that's <laughs> when I first called him a fat fuck yeah. from episode, you know, season one. 
and that was like the genie was out of the bottle and the rest is her story. But we never discussed the character. I just kind of got what he wanted me to do and did it. He got what I was doing and started writing more scenes for it. And somewhere along the line, I became his nemesis. Do you think he knew on that, that first time where he's telling you to rip Jeff a new asshole, that he knew that this was... Because even going back and watching some of your stand-up, like from the early days, oh. you weren't necessarily like tearing into people. No, you were doing however, observational. Yeah. In 1999, maybe 2000, somewhere around then, he saw me do a roast of Jerry Stiller. That was the Friars roast of Jerry Stiller on Comedy Central. Now, roasts, you do differently than I did my stand-up. Roast is very punchy, set up punch, and you gotta be blue. You have to be filthy dirty, otherwise you lose all respect. So I, you know, wrote this with a, with a friend of mine, Larry Amos, who's a great comedy writer. We came up with this roast, and uh, it was filthy. I was completely filthy. I said things like, um, Oh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, Maury Povich was on the day. As I said, Maury, we all wonder why you married Connie Chung. And then I remembered Jews love to eat Chinese. You know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> so it was like really, really dirty. But that's what you do on a roast, which was not my normal kind of... audience just went, my God. Yeah. <laughs> so it was not my normal stand-up kind of stuff, but that's what you do on a roast. So Larry saw that roast. Larry saw that roast, and it was like... I think he had auditioned a bunch of actresses in L.A., and then it was like ding, ding, ding. And then he said to Jeff... How about Susie Espen to play your wife? And Jeff's like, absolutely. They, they hadn't thought of me because I was in New York and I hadn't seen them in years. And that's when he called me and, and offered me the job. But at the time, it was, we didn't know what it was. it was. I didn't have a contract. I was a day player. Uh, we didn't know if it was going to go beyond a season. It was just this completely under-the-radar kind of thing the first few seasons. But uh, uh, what he figured out is that with you and very few other actors and actresses, I think, ever, there's a musicality to how you curse. It's a gift. It really is. It's like, <laughs> it's like you and Joe Pesci. If you start using, if you start dropping F-bombs, it sounds like beautiful music. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. That's so lovely. Uh, yeah, he saw that, he saw in that roast that I had a, a very, I had an ease with the language and was comfortable with it, and that's what he wanted. Has there ever been a scene or uh, a thing that you've been uncomfortable with doing outside of that first time that you had to call Jeff Garland a fat fuck? No, uh, and by the way, I got very used to that. Um, <laughs> I, I imagine Jeff had too as well. Yeah, well, people say to Jeff all the time, do you mind when Susie speaks to you that way? And he's always like, no, Susie Essman isn't speaking to Jeff Garland. Susie Green is speaking to Jeff Green. It's, we're acting. Um, I, I don't think that, no, I don't think so. There's never been anything that he's had me do that was uncomfortable in any way. Um, what about the, uh, what about the, car, the car seat? See the famous car seat. Oh, when I had to have an orgasm. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I, like we're driving. That was the 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 five episodes we shot here in New York, yeah. and we're driving. Incredibly funny scene. Oh I my mean, God! It's, I I watched it the other day because they had a marathon on on, on uh, HBO. It was snowing the day it was snowing. I was just like, let's just watch the old curbs because I hadn't seen them all, and they hold up. Yes. Beautifully. Um, I remember we were driving through Harlem shooting that scene, and I remember thinking to myself. In my wildest dreams, I never thought I was going to be driving through Harlem having an orgasm in a car next to Larry David. Never in did I ever think that. But it, that the funny thing about that scene was in between takes, Larry would do for me the type of orgasm he wanted me to have. <laughs> which that was, I wish that was on tape because that was hilarious. Uh, the, it, it, was, it was not my most comfortable moment. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, you do it. <laughs> um, with, I wasn't in bed with him, so that's the difference. Oh, lucky you, I guess. No, yeah. no, it's not, it's not that. That, to me, is always uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, I don't then know. You're, like, partially, I yeah. I don't know how these actors do these heavy sex scenes. I don't either. It's weird. Yeah. This crew all, you know, you, you're seeing, like, this hot scene. There's, there's a cameraman right here and another one right there, and makeup's there touching up, you know, your ass or something. I remember in the 90s, too, there were certain actors and actresses who would get married and then do a movie with steamy sex scenes together, and I'd always think that that was the strangest thing you could possibly do. What was even weirder was they do a hot sex scene and then they get married because they get confused that they thought that they were their characters. Leave their wives yeah, and, and their and husbands. Yeah, and then it never worked. Yeah. Because when you're in a film set, not as much anymore since we have, uh, 
you know, smartphones. But it used to be years ago, you'd be on a film set or a TV set, and you were in such an isolated, insular world for 16, 18 hours a day. You didn't, th those were the only people you were relating to and talking to day after day, and they always thought they were falling in love with each other. No, they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> Love's a little bit more than a summer yeah. camp vibe. <laughs> um, when you, how old were you when you first started doing stand up? 28. 28? Mm hmm. Is it fair to say, like, kind of a late, a late bloomer to it? Yeah, I, I didn't. I never thought I was going to do stand up. I thought I was going to be more like, a, like Carol Burnett, like a character actress, more of a sketch comedian. So you had entertainment in you before yeah, stand up. Yeah, but I was completely. When I finally did it, I was completely lost. I was in a depression, in a bad relationship. I had been waitressing for years. I just did not know what to do. And friends at the restaurant that I was working at, in order to make waitressing uh, fun for myself, I used to imitate all, I'd go back into the kitchen, I'd imitate all the uh, customers. And that's what I first started doing in stand-up. I used to just do these characters. I didn't even speak in my real voice. But uh, friends kind of forced me to get on stage, and I did which it never occurred to me to be a comic. Did you like it right away or was it? No, I was scared to death. Yeah. I was scared to death. And then these guys, there were these guys that had a comedy club downtown on University and 13th Street called Comedy U. And they saw me at my first open mic night and they came over to me and they said, we're opening up a club, we think you're really great. Uh, and I did like three minutes that night, but they, they liked me for some reason. And they said, we'd love to use you. Can we have your number? I gave them my number. I never thought I'd hear from them. I was never going to get on stage again because I was so terrified. Three, four months later, they called me. And they said, can you come down uh, you know, on a Sunday night and do 10 minutes? And like an idiot, I was like, yeah. I didn't know 10 minutes was a lot in yeah. stand-up. 10 minutes is like a lifetime in stand-up world. You know? Especially if you've only done three at an three. open mic a couple and I months wrote, before that. I wrote 10 minutes. Wow. And it was all character stuff. And I got up and I did it. And then they said, can you come back next Thursday? Can you? And they kept on hiring me. And I never worked anywhere but there for the first six months. And after about... About three months, I was like, this is what I was born to do. Wow. And, but it was all kind of an accident. Luckily, a what happy made accident. You feel like, what, what made you feel like this is what I was born to do? I felt very comfortable on stage. I, I just felt like I, this, I felt creative. I was writing constantly. I was just, I was in the spin of it, the world of it. Suddenly I was meeting people, all these other comedians that had the same references as I had and kind of got me in a way that nobody else really had before. And I found family, you know, and, and community, and, and uh, I loved being on stage. And this is probably right around the time, or at least a few years later, where you started uh, being social with Jeff and Larry? Uh, yeah, that was about 1984. I think I met Larry in 1985 or in 1986. Jeff didn't move to New York. I'm not sure when. Maybe 89, you know. Yeah, he was, when he moved to New York, I met him right away, because we were all at the clubs every night. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that you said uh, in the green room and just now when you were talking about watching reruns of Curb, when I said I was so happy Curb was back, you expressed almost almost the same kind of happiness that I did as a fan, which leads me to believe that you are a fan of the show yourself. I, I, I think it's really as objective as I could be. I can't be that objective. Like, are you able to watch yourself? I think it's the funniest show on TV, yes. and I think it's the funniest show in the history of television. Yeah. Um, I don't disagree. I, I can watch, I, you know what's interesting? I can't watch myself. I can't watch myself when I'm myself. Like, I'll never watch this, oh, you know? I, never, I, I would I never watch this either. When I'm myself on a talk show or something, I can't watch it. I could watch myself on Curb because I, I'm such a character and it's so funny and it tickles me to just see my outfits and, and the interaction, the relationship that I have with those two bozos, you know? Yeah. It's just so much fun to watch. So yeah, I do watch Curb. It's the only thing I watch of myself. Really? Yeah, I don't watch anything else. Did you, did you used to watch your stand-up at all? To no, try to take never. Notes oh, no, no, horrors, no. Listen to it? No, I, I was supposed to listen to it so you learn from it, but I couldn't. It was unbearable to me. I'd be like, ah, ah, cringe. Course, that makes sense. There's, it's just, it's, I mean, it's you as you, and there's right. nothing that you can do with that material. It's not like and, you can really cut it up or figure anything out with it. Well, you can if you want to hone a joke. Right. You know, if you want to hone a piece of material. And why isn't this working? Maybe if I took this out and put that in. You know, because stand-up, you're always working on the act. But the thing that I love about stand-up was the immediacy of it and the live aspect of it, that this is happening in this moment and it's never gonna happen again. And once it's on TV, it doesn't really work for me. I know everybody does their specials, but 
it's not like live. It's not like the danger. And it used to be way different because now everybody's got their phones and you know they're tweeting what you're saying or recording you or you got to be PC or whatever. In the old days, it was down and dirty in some underground little, you know, dark, smelly, smoky. Everybody was smoking comedy club, and it felt very private. It felt like we're we're all in this experience here together. It doesn't feel like that anymore. And in a lot of ways, it was be as dirty as possible. Exactly, and edgy, and you could push the envelope. And maybe go over the edge and be too far, and then realize you were and pull yourself back. Now, if you go over over the edge and you're too far, you're you're, you know, you're ostracized. Yeah. Do you worry? Have you worried about that as a comedian? No, because I don't really do stand up that much yeah, anymore. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah. When did? But I think I would. I think I would. When did you stop doing stand up, oh, or at least know. slow down? I don't want to say. I stop. mean, I still I do. I still do. You know, some private uh, private yeah. gigs and corporate and stuff like that. But clubs and theaters. A few years ago, I think I stopped a few years ago. It just kind of gradually played itself out. I mean, maybe I'll go back. I mean, Jeff still does it all the time, yeah. and a lot of comedians I know still do it. It just lost its allure for me. Jeff doesn't write anything down, right? Isn't that Jeff's thing? Is Je stand -up? Jeff's all the uh, crazy improv. Right. That's yeah. What I thought. Yeah. Um, was it something that, like, it, it, like, did you say it lost its steam, or was it something that the muscle itself requires so much attention, and so, like, going to clubs every night or every other night? That you know, I, I think that, that at a certain point, your muscle is, is developed. Like, I could get up on stage right now and do it, even though I haven't done it in a really long time. Um, I just think that, for me, creatively, I, I did it. I, it was really, really hard. For years. Really hard. And I did it, and I figured it out, and I did it well. I did it as well as I think I was going to do it. And I didn't, I wasn't that excited about doing it more. And, and I, think, I think an audience can sense that, and I, I, it's, it's not fair to an audience to do it when you're not excited about it. Do you have a favorite Curb episode at this point, since you are as loyal a fan, I think, as a lot of us are? Um... I would, oh, I would say The Doll. The Doll. The Doll. That was season two. Yeah, it was early. And I would say that it's my favorite for a number get of reasons. Get over here. Yeah, if, now, first of all, how often do you get to say, get me the fucking head! Yeah. You know, I mean, that was like <laughs> a thing of beauty. But also, it was, it was season two, and it was the first time I had that spaghetti Western music that became my theme, which I loved. And it's the first time that you really see that we create the dynamic that Jeff and Larry live in fear of Susie. Yeah. You know, and I just love that so much. But that changes for Larry. Larry doesn't, they have like a push and pull they relationship do. now they that's do. less based out of fear and see who can push each other's buttons. I know. And we've do, and, and what's interesting about it, it, it's evolved over the, as all relationships do. Yeah. You know, it's been 20 years. Um, do you think they love each other? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and Susie, as much as she can't stand Larry and, I can't even count the number of times that she's kicked him out of her house. Yeah. Um, I, just, I just watched a clip where she offers to give him a tour of, of the oh, house. the house tour. And he says, no, I don't want a house tour. Get the get, fuck get out, the fuck out. <laughs> you fuck, Over. I'm you, done. You fucking freak of nature. <laughs> you don't want a house tour? Freak of fucking nature, freak I believe it was. Um, um, yeah, but, but uh, yeah, I think she's very loyal to Larry in a certain way. He's, her, he's, he's like family. You know, yeah. you know, siblings say you fight, fight, but they're your sibling. They're always going to be your sibling. Same thing with Susie and Larry. Yeah. Um, my, maybe my, my favorite episode is the Freak Book episode. Oh, yeah, yeah. Larry gets thrown out of... With John McEnroe. Yes. <laughs> uh, just because of the scene where Larry and Jeff can't stop laughing at the Freak Book yeah. in front of all of the people and how... Rude that is, and I think at one point you're like that fucking freak book, yelling at them. I haven't seen that one in a really long time. I think that was season four or something. Yeah, something maybe. Like that. Yeah. Uh, in the new season, there's uh, after the first episode, there's a sense that uh, one of the dramatic arcs is going to be Larry gets me tooed, which uh, is that going to de does that develop over the course of the rest of the season? Maybe. <laughs> does Susie <laughs> have an opinion about that throughout the course of the season? I know, actually. I don't think so. I don't recall. I don't think so. No. You know, we shot it a year ago, and really? I forget. I forget everything. Of course, <laughs> yeah. because you're not there for every storyline, and I'm probably no. You probably don't even get the entire the entire scripts, right? You just no. Get... I get the whole outline. Oh, you do. I read the whole outline. Yeah. I guess that yeah. makes sense. You sort of have to because you're improvising. Well, you know what? I, I mean, I think this season more people got the outline, but in seasons past, Larry did not give anybody the outlines. I would get them. And uh, Jeff, of course, he's an EP. Uh, but he, didn't, he never wanted any of the guest stars to have the outlines because he didn't want them 
coming up with bad sitcom lines that they, you know, it's improvised. So usually what happens with the guest star is they show up, they're told what the scene is about, and it's go. They don't know any more than that. Right. But I've always read the outlines, and I find it helpful because I like to know, for example, let's say I'm doing a scene, and the scene before this scene is somebody yelling and screaming at Larry. If I know that, then I might not be yelling and screaming at him so much. I might ease into it in a different way. Because you need the rhythm. You don't want the, everything to be here. You know, you want it to, right. to have some colors. And I guess the fear is that bad sitcom lines is also just somebody uh, not being able to sort of be in the moment. Right, right. right? And you, you have to be in the moment when you're improvising. And, and, and I've seen it happen where people come up with lines that they think are funny and they try to throw it. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Of course, because it's it's going to take the other actor out of the moment. That's I right. imagine, especially it's going to especially take Larry out of the moment. And right, he like, hates it. Yeah, he hates it, and he could smell it coming a mile away. You know, he's written some of the best sitcom lines ever, so he knows how to do it. He doesn't need anybody else doing it. No, exactly. But 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 also, when you're improvising, it's really important not to pre-plan what you're going to say. And the only time you really do need to pre-plan it is when there's something that's necessary for story. Yeah. Like there might be, you know, Happy New Year, for example, was in the episode the other night. There might be some point, I didn't, but there might have been some point where he said to me, when you walk out of the room, I want you to say Happy New Year. Other than that... Right. Every argument ends with right. Happy fucking New Year, Larry. Right, and that's whatever, it, yeah. because that's part of the storyline. Other than that, things of that nature, nothing's written and nothing's pre-planned. There's a lot of, I think, myth and lore about Larry David as a human, yes. as a man outside of the shows. <laughs> um, he seems to me, I mean, he's always been described as neurotic. He's so not neurotic. He, neurotic he to me him. means... He looks like a man comfortable in his he, own skin. He is. And, and neurotic, I think people confuse idiosyncratic with neurotic. Mm. Neurotic is fearful. Larry's not a fearful person at all. Yeah, is he a little germ phobic? Yeah, so am I. I didn't touch you because you have a cold. I have a cold. Um, but, I told but, you not to. But, right. I preempted. Thank you, and I appreciate that. But um, he's not neurotic at all. He's he's one of the least neurotic people I know. He's he's a genius. And I say that very carefully because I don't use that word often. He's a genius. He's not like other people. So he's a little, you know, he's in his head a little bit more than other people are. So he might come off as idiosyncratic. How do you, uh, the word genius to me is so interesting because I try not to use it as much as it's, possible. It's I think overused. We overuse it. Yeah. Um, I mean, Larry, just simply by the body of his work, we could say at this point, is a genius. And also its uh, effect on culture. Seinfeld and Curb are two of the, the most classic comedy shows ever. Right. Um, but how do you qualify? Uh, how do you qualify a well, genius? I'm a comic. I have comic brain, it just works in a certain comedic way. I read those outlines. And I have no idea how he got there. It's transcendent. I, I read them and I, and I think, I, I don't know how he put this to, I can't even figure it out. His brain works in a different way. His brain works in a way that, and I think that's what genius is, it's transcendent. You can't, you cannot, you can't know how Mozart got those notes mm -hmm. together. He heard something that nobody else heard. And I think that that's what Larry does. He, Here's something that nobody else hears, and it's very, very original and unique. And people try to be do Larry, and That's they can't. That's what I was going to say. I think what, what the other layer of genius for someone like Larry and some other artists that are off the top of my head is that they are able to uh, distill and simplify. So right. someone watches Curb or Seinfeld and goes, wow, I want to do that. I could be a comedy writer. Yeah, and they don't it. recognize <laughs> that like there is a, com a total brilliance behind everything that's right. happening there. And part of that brilliance is simplifying it so it's very digestible. And, and I think that's what comics do in general is they see... They see more than other people do, or see they see things in a twisted prism. So uh, that's why a good comic, there'll be a uh, there'll be a, a moment of of uh, uh, oh right, I think that too, but I didn't think of it in that way, yep. you know, in that particular twist. And Larry does that brilliantly. Yeah. I think we have time for a couple questions from the audience. Who's a question? They're coming Someone to get have a us. Question. So right there, do you have a microphone? Do you have a question? Hello. Hey, Susie. Big fan. You really make the show. Thank you. And uh, everything. Uh, really quick question. Wanted to know, working on the show with LD and all the other cast and crew, were there any unexpected lessons that uh, you learned or maybe some funny story that really taught you something about life, about being a better entertainer, being a better comedian? Wow, that's heavy. 
Um, you know, I, I mean, I've learned so much from working with Larry about about comedy and and what to push and not to push. It's it's uh, how how to go as far as you can go and then pull back slightly. You know, it, it's hard. To, I can't think of an example really because it's also organic. Um, but he he pushes it. You know, there are times when I read an outline, I'm like, oh, I think he went too far. And then somehow he makes it work. So I, I think that the lesson that I've learned from working on this show all this time is that you could really get away with saying anything as long as it's funny. The biggest crime is not being funny, not, not saying something that's offensive or, or hurtful. The biggest crime is not being funny. I will say, I, at the end of this first episode of this season, I was like, is he going to be able to pull this storyline off? Like the Me Too story, like Larry oh, getting yeah. Me Too. I was immediately like, like if anybody's going to be able to do it, it's going to be this show and it's going to be him. But it's one of those things like, wow, you're treading into the water. But, you now. know, I've thought that so many times. I thought I thought that that that, you know, he was going to get such a backlash from Jews for Palestinian chicken. Didn't. I thought he was going to get such backlash from from Muslims from for the fatwa. He didn't. I thought, you know, like on and on and on. The African-American community when he adopted Afri the blacks. Exactly. <laughs> and he didn't because it's funny. Yes. And I and I do think with, with offending people, and this is just from my point of view as a comic, um, it's all about intent. Yeah. You know, and when somebody has a negative intent, the audience can feel it. You know, and, and when you're making fun of a of an ethnic group or whatever, and your intent is not malicious in any way, an or audience can like feel it. The audience can feel, even if they don't even know that there's a malicious intent there, there's some sort of resentment that it comes from. The audience right. can sort of They can, can feel it. That. And yeah. and Larry has no malice in him. Yeah. And he's an equal opportunity offender. Yeah. You know, he'll uh, offend every every ethnicity, every religion, it, everything. Uh, so uh, that's part of it also. Uh, one more. First of all, Happy New Year. Uh, Thank you. It's a little geez. late. What are we yes. now? Yes, well, <laughs> weeks in. You know, I watched the episode last <laughs> night. It's phenomenal. Oh, my God. I cannot wait. It, Unbelievable. It was, it, was, it was one of the best openers ever that I think we've had. Brilliant. Uh, Susie, you have such a distinctive voice, and you've lent uh, your talents to a lot of animated projects yeah. like Adventure Time, American Dad, and Bolt. Bolt, I want to ask, yeah. what's your experience like in the studio versus on stage or in front of the camera? Well, you know, it's doing animation is really weird because I love doing animation and I'd love to do more of it, but the, you're all by yourself. Like I did Bolt, I, I, every, every one of my scenes was with John Travolta, I never met him. I never, you know, so you're by yourself in a studio. It's so different than being in a scene with somebody where you're actually acting. And it's bizarre because you, you have to record every possible intonation of, of the line. Fast, slow, loud, soft, and then they kind of match it with the other actor, and then they animate it to that. It's a really slow process. I like it, it's fun, but it's not acting in the same way. It's a different chop than being in a scene with somebody. Especially in a scene like Curb, where you're improvising, where you're, yeah. and you're kind of coming up with it together. That's right. That's... How, how long does a scene typically... Thank you take to shoot and to take shape or do you generally do the do you well, guys generally that's have a good shape? question because uh, sometimes we find the scene in the first take yeah. more often than not it takes us about five six seven takes to find the scene and then we'll kind of like said okay that's it now so now we're going to do it this way and you know and we kind of remember what we said and maybe not completely remember and then change it a little bit but um we do a lot a lot of takes because because it's improvised Editing needs a lot of coverage because for time, you know, when you're when you're shooting a script, it's usually about a page a minute. We don't have that, so editing needs a lot of coverage and a lot of leeway. So we shoot a lot of takes. Do you find that by the time you're 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 ironing out, you're down to your last takes, that you've essentially boiled it down to the words that you're using, or are you yes, still more, throwing more out new often, stuff? More often than not, we've kind of boiled it down. But you know, then like you know, we'll all try to like throw in little things to surprise each other. <laughs> you know, I'll think, oh, this will be funny. I'm going to surprise Larry with this one. Or, you know, we, we, we do that also. As long as it's not like a sitcom line. Yeah, okay. as long as it's not a sitcom line or as long as it's not throwing us off track in, right. in some way. You know, mm -hmm. the scene has to be about the scene. Yeah. You know, it has to be about the story. And you have to be willing to throw out the stuff that's gold and funny to, to, for, for the story purpose. 
course. I mean, that's one of the great things about Curb Your Enthusiasm is that, yes, it feels improvised, but it's actually extremely beat-driven. Extremely. We know what each scene is about. You know, I, I know what my relationships are to each character. I know where we have to get in the scene. It's very well-structured. So all these shows that tried to do improv shows yeah. based on Curb didn't work because... Uh, really what Larry's genius is, is story. Incredibly genius story. It's one yeah. of the great ironies of Seinfeld is that one of the sort of classic storylines of Seinfeld is that they didn't want to do a show with any story. But it's all story. But it's all story. It's all story. And that's what he is the best. His story, uh, his ability to create story and is beyond anything I've ever seen. I go back and I watch Seinfeld episodes and any episode you put on in front of me, Throughout the entire episode, I would go, oh, this is the episode where that happens? Where that happens? Yeah. Where that happens? So, like, the list goes on and on and on in terms of how much story he piles and, on. And they've gotten, our stories have gotten denser yeah. and denser. Last season and this season, <clears throat> each episode took us so long to shoot because it was, like, this episode that, that was on the other night, it, you, know, you know, you had the, the, the Harvey Weinstein, the MAGA hat, the, <laughs> the, the, the Cheryl, the, 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 the storyline with Cheryl. The story, I mean, there was like so many different stories. The storyline with Randy, my friend who was pregnant. There was so much in that episode, so much. The, the Mocha Joe and the, his opening Latte Larry's. I mean, there's so much in that episode. The line in Mocha Joe, uh, in the scene with Mocha Joe, where he says, I don't think you know what a scone is, Mocha Joe. Yes. It's so funny. <laughs> but that's just like Seinfeld. The later seasons got incredibly dense yeah. story. It just seems that the more he does This is shows, why I don't remember anything of what happened for this, because there was so much stuff in each episode. Is there anything you can tease about Susie for, that happens this uh, season? I'll be wearing some crazy outfits. <laughs> and, um, As Susie does. Yeah. Uh, I think it's episode... Five is a, is a, an episode which to me is one of the f I'm not going to say what it is, but it's one of the funniest storylines he's ever given me. Really? Yeah, it's so oh. funny. Well, I uh, can't wait to see it, and I'm so glad you came by to talk Thank to us you, about Ricky. the show and your work on it. It is one of the great shows that that, that we've had. Susie Essman, everybody, let's Thank hear you. it. Thank you. Now you can all go back to work.